There are definitely studies which show that they can have a detrimental effect to some of these beneficial microbes. But in my, my mind, the jury's still out because I think we don't understand the complexity of these different sweeteners. We also don't understand, obviously, the complexity of a microbiome and the adaptation of the microbiome to consumption of these sweeteners. Let's talk about artificial sweeteners for a second. A highly contentious topic. Yes. And I've recently, along with a couple of my colleagues, we, we put out a very lengthy piece of content to our premium audience, uh, to, the, to the newsletter, which is literally it's probably a it's a 15,000 word treatise on all things related to non-nutritive sweeteners uh, and non-sugar sweeteners that are themselves nutritive so so it's a pretty broad piece you know without recasting the entire thing it's really clear that there's something going on with these non-nutritive sweeteners beyond their caloric or non-caloric impact in other words we all understand that sucrose has its you know four kilocalories per gram it's broken down into one part glucose, one part fructose. We understand the metabolism of those things, and we understand that if consumed in excess, you have probably some harm beyond just the caloric side vis-a-vis -vis the fructose molecule and not the glucose molecule. But it's now also clear that under isocaloric conditions, high quantities of non-nutritive sweeteners are not entirely benign. And so I guess I'd start with the question of what do we know about how the gut addresses these, if for no other reason, because of the fact that these are very foreign molecules in the concentrations we consume them. I mean, we consume glucose and fructose for our entire existence. We're just seeing it in a higher concentration now, but probably not as much of a multiple in concentration as we see aspartame or sucralose. Well, first of all, I'm going to give all the caveats that you are clearly a far deeper expert in all of this than I am. I haven't spent hardly I'm any not, time though, thinking I, about it. I know nothing about the impact on the gut, really. <laughs> um, just, just the observations clinically about you know, what we see in terms of sugar cravings and other repetitive behaviors mm -hmm. and metabolic symptoms, which I'm kind of asking, do you think part of that is manifested through the gut? And there was that very famous paper in Nature a few years ago, which sort of suggested that in mice. Yeah. Well, so first of all, there have been um, a lot of studies done in mice, and we've already talked about the advantages and disadvantages to getting too uh, um, fired up about mouse studies. But I think, especially in the microbiome, but I think that um, the data that's out there is conflicting around the impact of these non-nutritive sweeteners on the microbiome. And maybe it's because of what you just pointed out, which is that the these things are not all created equal. And so by kind of lumping them together and doing these studies, um, you know, that might be causing some, some of this conflict. I think it's relatively early stage. A lot of studies have been done in animals. There are definitely studies which show that they can have a detrimental effect to some of these beneficial microbes. Um, um, but I, I, in my my mind, the jury's still out because I think we don't understand the complexity of these different sweeteners. We also don't understand, obviously, the complexity of a microbiome and the adaptation of the microbiome to consumption of these sweeteners. And so, yeah, evolutionarily, maybe these things haven't been around for very long. But again, because how because fast of the rapid evolution, you replicate. Yeah. Your, I mean, there's bacteria that can metabolize small molecule drugs. They've definitely never They've seen. They've never before. seen. Yeah. So I I think that is going to be the name of the game is to understand how does your microbiome evolve to these and, you know, how does it help or hurt you? And and how's that linked to, meta you know, the metabolic Yeah, pathway? I mean, my, my takeaway is, is all of that and then layered onto that something you said earlier, which is you can take five people and give them the, who are the same weight and give them the same dose of digoxin and they're going to have five different PKs. Uh, for those listening who don't understand the term PK, it refers to like the concentration of the drug within their body. In other words, a product of their metabolism. So I would say the same is probably true for aspartame, sucralose, saccharin, all of the above, which is I have seen so many cases of people who are trying to lose weight, trying to improve their metabolic health, drinking six Diet Cokes a day. And they're, you know, they're saying, look, I'm getting zero calories in here. And I nothing will budge. Do me a favor, substitute soda water for the Diet Coke for a month. Let's see if it makes a difference. And the world changes. Wow. Now, I don't know what to make of that because it's anecdotal and I don't have perfect control over the situation. So it's certainly possible that when they started drinking all the Topo Chico and started ditching the Diet Coke, that they were also doing 10 other things that changed. So I really don't know, but I've seen it enough in both directions, where it works and where it doesn't work, that I 
I do wonder if there are individual factors where in that individual for whom it becomes a productive change, there's a lack of symbiosis between the evolution of their bacteria in the high aspartame environment versus the adaptation of another person in the context of a high, like my, my wife drinks Diet Coke, right? It's like, I say that like it's somehow bad, like, but she, <laughs> she freaking loves Diet Coke. She probably has like one every other day. I don't know that that's a high or low dose, but it is. She's as healthy as she's a horse. She's in great shape. She, yeah, yeah. She's as healthy as a horse. Um, if I drink it, I can't stand the taste of it truthfully, but sometimes I'm like so parched and thirsty, I'll drink one. <laughs> doesn't seem to cause me any ills. But again, I've seen people, and, and there's clearly an association um, between its use and, and otherwise. That, that would be a super interesting study, I think, to do where you would basically take a bunch of individuals and you would look at their, you know, get some baseline data around their microbiome, and then you would put them, you would start them either on a bunch of Diet Cokes uh, or you would start them on a bunch of, you know, just soda water and then measure their microbiome over time. And then I'd do a little washout period or maybe just switch yeah, them do right a crossover. over, do a yeah. crossover and see what happens. Because, you know, it really is a question. And this, this is kind of my frustration with a lot of the microbiome studies that are done is they treat it um, the, the way that we do, you know, drug studies, which is you just have cohorts and you're just comparing them to each other. Really, in the microbiome, the person matters. And so crossover designs are going to give you way more information about what's doing what in that person. And then you can start to draw themes about pathways. But that would be an interesting design to do because it could be that at the onset, if there was something about these people who could you know, live off of Diet Coke, and let's assume people prefer Diet Coke over, you know, uh, unflavored soda water. If there was something about their starting microbiomes that enabled them to, you know, lose weight uh, in, in that way or be healthy in that way, that could be a solution. So like, I'll tell you, there's a was a very interesting study that was done where they took all these people, they put them all on the same diet. And I mean, you've, everybody has experienced this, you don't have to be a physician, you know, you go on a diet, somebody else goes on a diet, one person loses way more weight than the other person. So they were trying to understand, is there something about the starting microbiome that changes the way people respond to, you know, they just did a regular high fiber diet. And um, they found that if you start out with higher levels of acromancia, you know, not to keep going back to this strain, but it really is like this keystone strain for a reason. This study, you know, what they showed was that if you had higher starting le levels of acromancia, that was associated associated with all the metrics of um, responding better to the diet in terms of BMI, hip to waist ratio, um, you know, A1C, weight, all of these things, those people did better. And it's correlative, but they, if they had higher starting amounts, they responded better to the diets. So I do think there's something about the microbiome that can help you or hurt you as you go through these kind of nutrition changes. To me, a corollary of what you just said is if your microbiome is suboptimal, which we can define in a number of ways, but let's use one very specific example. If you are completely deficient in or woefully deficient in acromancia, it is harder for you to have a favorable response to a healthy intervention and or you may be more susceptible to the downside of a less healthy intervention. So on the one hand, you may be more impacted negatively by something like non-nutritive sweeteners and you may be less responsive to dietary corrections. Is that, would you agree with that statement? I think that is definitely, um, th that would that's, be, that's, the that's what, that data, that's what yeah. that data points to. Yeah. That yeah. kind of a hypothesis. Yeah.